Yo. What it do, Facebook? What it do, what it do, what it do? Let's see if I got enough juice to get my intro music on. Let's go ahead and share the stream first. Let that charge up. Maybe I get to 2%. What's going on, y'all? How's everybody feeling uh, this morning? What up, Kurt? Financial War Room in the building. Antonio Jennings, top of the morning to you. Banzea. Hey. What's going on? What's going on? Go ahead and type in the chat where you're from. Name of your business and or brand. Where are you from? Name of your business and or brand. And share the stream. Price of admission for talking money in the morning is a simple share. Get this good free value. All you got to do is share the stream. Not too much to ask. I don't think. And I'm going to share it myself right now. <clears throat> Raleigh, North Carolina. Uh, Cornell, what's going on, my friend? Where you from, Cornell? Let the people know where you're from. What business or brand are you building? There you go. Financial War Room is in the building. All right. There we go. Brooklyn, New York. All right, all right, so I've got it shared. Let's see. If I can get my intro music up. Welcome, welcome to the broadcast. Welcome, guys. Go ahead and hit the share button as Facebook is building up the stream. I'm gonna go ahead and get YouTube queued up. Let's get YouTube uh, on and popping as well. Yeah, blessings from the Bahamas. Okay, Antonio. Welcome from the Bahamas, NASA. All right, good deal. All right, I'm just waiting on my intro, my tablet to come up with the intro music, and then we'll get started. Today we're talking about five things poor and middle class people absolutely need to learn if they're going to prosper. Now, if they don't want to prosper, they don't have to learn this stuff. If you're going to prosper, you have to learn these five things, among many other things. Uh, let's be honest there, but these are five that uh, can transform your life like right quick, right quick. So let me get my audio together. There we go. All right, let's do this thing, man. We're running a little bit behind. I had some trouble with Facebook this morning, but we got a good 45 minutes, so let's do it.
Good morning, black world, and welcome to Talking Money in the Morning Live with your main man, H. Cortez, the one and only financial health mentor to the black community, everybody's favorite fatherpreneur, where I do my absolute best to bring practical yet proven wealth building strategies to working men and women all over this great country of ours. It's truly a blessing and an honor to come to you live and direct from the Generational Wealth Building Conference Studios here in St. Louis, Missouri. If you're not familiar with the Generational Wealth Building Conference, it's going down in Atlanta, GA, April 6th through the 8th. And you can get your tickets at wealth.joincortezenow.com. Wealth.joincortezenow.com. You can buy a uh, well, weekend pass and attend all the events, or you can buy tickets for you, the individual sessions that you want to attend. Uh, this is thrown uh, presented by the Black Billionaires Club. And uh, it's going to be a phenomenal event, man. There's a, a wealth building summit for the kids. There's a women empowerment event. Uh, and then a main uh, event is going to be the Sunday brunch with all of the panelists, all of the financial educators and uh, wealth strategists teaching uh, real estate, uh, stocks, uh, cryptocurrency, uh, international trade. It's just going to be a phenomenal, phenomenal experience. You've got to be in the building if you're going to uh if you're the name of the goal is to build generational wealth for your family you need to partner with some people who are doing it land the foundations uh drafting and crafting the blueprints to get it done create some partnerships some conglomerates uh there you, you will walk out of there with a plan of action with partners uh in tow to help you get that thing done again go to wealth.joincortezenow.com to grab your tickets do me a huge favor if you're checking us out on youtube go ahead and subscribe to the channel we will hit 2,000 subscribers uh by the end of this month We've got a short time to get these next couple hundred subs uh in but go ahead and subscribe to the channel if you haven't already and make sure that you interact with the show i can see your uh, comments uh, in uh, living color. So make sure that you let me know where you're from and the name of your business and brand. Comment that in the chat. I'd like to give you a business shout out as well. Uh, Morantine uh, uh, Zillionaires. Good morning, Talisha. Uh, let me know the name of your business or brand uh, and also where you're from. We're at uh, 1817 is the subscribers on uh, YouTube right now. Uh, so Go ahead and uh, make sure you subscribe. Make sure you rate the video as well <clears throat> and then interact with the show. My Facebookers, uh, do the same thing. Go ahead and uh, like the fan page, Financial Health Mentor, and then make sure you turn on notifications. I'm always live on this page uh, trying to kick the knowledge on how to prosper, how to build wealth, how to be better versions of yourself in each and every day. And guys, if you are on Facebook and, you, and Facebook is your platform, I get it. That's cool. But do me a favor. If you don't mind, hop over to the YouTube channel and go ahead and subscribe. It's youtube.com forward slash financial health mentor. Do me that favor uh, at some point today. Just go into your YouTube account, uh, uh, do a search on financial health mentor, and go ahead and subscribe to uh, the channel and help us reach our goal of uh, 2,000 subscribers. Uh, Smiley's daughter uh, is the brand for Talisha out of uh, Tacoa. Georgia. Welcome to the broadcast this morning. Uh, <clears throat> today's show is also brought to you by the Black Wealth Movement. Uh, if you want to learn how to uh, build wealth from scratch, then you need to plug into the Black Wealth Movement. Get you some coaching, some mentorship, and five areas of building wealth. Entrepreneurship, tax minimization, debt elimination, credit education, and asset accumulation or investing. Ken, I uh, appreciate uh, uh, the feedback, Ken. Thank you for joining the stream this morning. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel. So who we got with us? We got Boutique House Enterprises uh, checking in from Gary, Indiana. We got Rise and Grind uh, Wealth Artists, uh, Financial Education for Artists and Working Class People. Uh, we got future leaders in the building, uh, a regular. Uh, just getting started with entrepreneurship currently uh, with uh, Inspire Network. Uh, if that's what you mean, I am from New Jersey. Always love to listen to you or wherever you are. Yes, that is what I mean. But you got to start working on your individual brand. Inspire is their brand. But what separates you from everybody else in Inspire? And why would people want to buy from you or join your team versus anybody else? You got to have your own personal brand. Uh, but welcome to the broadcast, Steve, my man uh, from the 215 in the building. And then we got Financial War Room. Uh, 
Uh, welcome, welcome, welcome to uh, the broadcast. East Hartford, Stacy. good morning. Uh, Cedric Jenkins, what's going on, Alabama and the building? All right, so what are the five things that poor and middle class people have to learn in order to prosper, right? Number five, uh, Body by Bazell is in the building on YouTube. Appreciate you for joining, as always, Queen. Um, number five, poor and middle class people uh, uh, Jenkins Enterprises, uh, Enterprise Group LLC is in the building from uh, Alabama. Poor and middle class people have got to, got to, got to uh, learn how to get over past hurts. Right? Uh, says, uh, good morning, got them subscribed. Uh, <laughs> butter me up. Uh, freedom.5. Uh, okay, good. Checking in from. Charleston, South Carolina. All right. Yes, I appreciate you for subscribing. Uh, poor and middle class people have got to learn how to get over past hurts. That's number five. I'm going to go from five to one. Uh, and I think they're going to get better and better as we go. But got to learn how to get over past hurts. Uh, and one of the reasons is um, past hurts are holding you back. If you don't know how to get over and deal with them, uh, they will hurt, hold you back. And, and I really should, should say not just get over it, but deal with them. You can't just get over something. You actually have to deal with it. But I know that a lot of poor and middle class people are, are being held back from their true potential. They're not unlocking that power that they have within them because they tend to hold on to past hurts. Another thing that past hurts will do uh, that's killing you uh, and your potential to prosper and be the greatest version of yourself is when you're holding on to bitterness, resentment because of past hurts, it clouds your judgment. Clouds your judgment. We also know that poor middle class people take a long time to make a decision and they're quick to change their mind about that decision. One of the reasons it takes poor and middle class people so long to make a decision is because they're holding on to past hurts. I can't decide to move forward today because of my experience that I had in the past and I'm bringing that into this decision and I'm wavering back and forth on whether to move forward or not. Got to hold on to past hurts. Uh, Eugene, what's going on? He says, currently uh, listening from Iraq, but from South Carolina. Well, appreciate you uh, for uh, uh, taking the show international, uh, if you will. So past hurts is a big one that we have to understand how to get over so that we can move forward. Uh, a holding on to a past hurt is, is like being anchored to that hurt and you're being anchored into one place when you've got this vast ocean that you've got to, to cross, but you're not moving because you're anchored in one space because you're holding on to past hurts. Uh, number four, we absolutely have to understand the meaning of sacrifice. We've got to learn to sacrifice if we're going to prosper. Sacrifice is to voluntarily give up something, temporarily give up something so that we can gain something else. Voluntarily give up something so that we can gain something else or temporarily give up something so that we can gain something else. I want everybody to do me a favor. If the name of the game for you is to build generational wealth, I want you to put in the, the, the chat at least one thing you're willing to sacrifice to make that happen. What's one thing you're willing to sacrifice? You're willing to give this up either permanently or temporarily to make generational wealth happen for you and your family. What is the one thing are you willing to give up? I'll give you a few of mine. I'm willing to give up a little sleep. I'm willing to give up a little leisure time. I'm willing to give up a little money. I'm willing to give up uh, 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 some relationships. I'm willing to give up TV. I'm willing to give up, man, 
This is generation building generational wealth for me is such a big part of who I am and what I'm trying to accomplish over the next 10 years that I'm almost willing to give up everything except my integrity. My family and my integrity, everything else is on the table. <laughs> I'm, I'm not even going to play with you. Uh, my family and my integrity, everything else is on the table. <laughs> Every, I'm talking about I'm willing to give up everything but my family and my integrity to make generational wealth a reality for me. And what I mean by generational wealth is I want to make sure that my children don't have to start from scratch. I don't want my children to have to start over. I, I want to make sure that my children's children are 20 times, 30 times, 40 times better off than where I am. I want to make sure that I have a foundation so big, poured and laid, that a 200 story skyscraper can be built on it because I anticipate that my children will build that skyscraper. Uh, you just said, right, I'm with you. Everything else is on the back end. Yeah, I, I mean, my family and my integrity, only thing I'm not willing to give up. Everything else is fair game. But I can, if I can build generational wealth without this, that, or the other, I'm willing to give that up. My family and my integrity. We've got to learn to sacrifice. Right? Got to learn to sacrifice. Number three thing that we have got to learn is we got to learn how to collaborate with others more. We've absolutely got to learn to collaborate with others. Uh, there's nothing wrong with good, healthy competition. But collaboration is where it's at. And, and a lot of times, it's not so much about... Um, it's not so much about not trusting other people to work with. A lot of times, it's more about just feeling like we've got to do everything ourselves, right? Yeah, I agree. The, the true American dream is not having your children work as hard as you uh, had to. Uh, it, it, the, the feeling is that we've got to do everything ourselves. See, the, the, especially when it comes to black people, uh, we have been so separated in our thinking and in, in reality, that we feel that we are all independent and we, we, we don't understand interdependence, right? We believe that, hey, this is me, this is mine, I've got to do this and I'm doing it on my own. So I don't want to collaborate with anyone. I don't want, I, I want to get all the credit. I don't want to uh, uh, have a partnership. I, I don't want a 50 50. I don't want a 70 30. I'm going to do this all myself, right? Yeah, it's, it's been instilled in us. So we don't collaborate uh, as much as we could. And that could actually cause us to advance a lot further, a lot faster. One of my favorite African proverbs of all time is to go fast, go alone. But to go far, you go together. <laughs> to go fast, go alone. To go far, you must go together. So we've got to get over this collaboration thing. The other thing that we, what, what tends to hold us back from collaborating, my camera's gotten fuzzy all of a sudden. I need to stop moving so much, I guess. It's out of focus. There we go. The other thing that we have to, to, to realize and, and one of the problems that we have when it comes to uh, collaborating with others is we don't vet other people's motives when we do collaborate, right? We don't vet other people's motives. What I mean by that is we, when we do collaborate with others, 
it's usually out of necessity versus out of uh, a, a true genuine partnership to see it at a mission or to see something accomplished, right? Yeah, socially engineered, uh, uh, as with individualism, that, that is very, very true. Uh, that is very, very true. But we, when you have like minds come together, collaboration is easy. See, when you what, what we tend to do is we collaborate with people who are going in the same direction, but they are not necessarily like minded. And what happens is we're going in the same direction, but we're going for two different reasons. And eventually those reasons will cause us to clash. So when I'm building my team of wealth strategists, there's a lot of people that want to build wealth for a lot of different reasons. But my core group that I really work with and entrust and that I collaborate with the most, these are the people who want to build wealth so that they can put their family in a different situation, but then reach back and build up the community. Everybody doesn't share that vision and that mission, right? So I can only collaborate with those people so far. Yes, we can collaborate on the first phase, building wealth and getting your family to a different position, but then you might want to get your family to a different position, and then that's as far as you want to go with this collaborative effort. But because I know that, I'm not mad when you get to where you want to be. Problem is we collaborate with people who we assume want to go all the way and we've never even asked them what their intentions are, what their motives are, how far they're willing to go, what they're willing to give up. We've never even asked them. So when they get what they want out of the deal and they go a different direction, now we're salty. So when you do collaborate with folks, make sure you're collaborating with folks of like mind. Make sure you know exactly what each is bringing to the table and how far they're willing to go. And it's okay for me to collaborate with somebody and we can only go so far. Cool. This is where we part ways. It's been a fun ride. I appreciate the collaboration. I appreciate the help. I appreciate what I learned from you as, as I'm sure you appreciate what you learned from me. And we got this far together. Neither one of us would have come this far without each other. Now it's time for me to collaborate with somebody else who wants to go further down the road. And that's okay. But start finding out if the people you're collaborating with is the mind like yours. How far are they willing to go down this mission? Or are they, what are they willing to give up? Some people are only willing to fight so hard. You got to know this on the front end. Right? Some people are only willing to sacrifice so much. And you've got to know this on the front end in your collaborative efforts. Right? You can't get mad at people. Uh, so, so, you, so you think about the civil rights movement. There were people who walked with Dr. King. And they were only will, willing to go so far. And when those dogs and those hoses came out, that was as far as they were willing to go. Then there were other people who went through that with them. Dogs, hoses. There were other people who were locked up with Dr. King. But you can't be mad and be salty at the people who turned around when they saw the dogs and the hoses. Everybody is not willing to sacrifice everything, but it helps to know how far somebody is willing to go with you on the front end. That way we don't got to be salty. You told me in the beginning that it, when, it, when, when, when ish get real, that's as far as you're willing to go. And I can appreciate that. Well, help me get to the point where ish gets real and then I'll find someone else to collaborate with me and go through this phase of it with me. We got to understand the power of collaboration, right? Comes from trust, comes from understanding. It comes from a good open dialogue and a communication with one another. Um, other thing that we've got to learn is, uh, yeah, what are your intentions? Simple question. It's a simple question. What are your intentions? Right? Uh, one of the things that we've got to learn how to do is we got to start learning how to spend more time in the future than we do in the past. 
We absolutely have to learn how to spend more time in the future than we do in the past. Right? So getting over past hurts is one thing, but some of us absolutely live in the past because we have come to the conclusion that our past days are greater than our former days. Some of us did some amazing things in our past and we believe that that is the best that life has to offer us. And as a result, we're living in that. We're still celebrating in that. We're still glorifying in that thing which we did 20 years ago, 10 years ago. Man, when I was when I was hustling, I was rolling big, man. I had the money, I had the cars, and that's all you talk about every time somebody sees you. Man, when I was in high school, it was this, it was that, and that's all you talk about. When I was in college, I was a man. I was the, the, the homecoming queen, I was, and that's all you talk about. Take the lessons from the past, and then you project them into the future and see your former days to be, I mean, your, your, your future days to be greater than your former days. We all know people who live in the past, right? It's, I know it's Thursday, it's Throwback Thursday, and it's okay to reminisce about your past, but there are people who are living there. It's like, man, you've got to come out of that and uh, Acknowledge where you are today and then you've got to go out into the future and see where you can be and where you're going And then you take that back and you bring that back into the present and say, okay Here's what I need to be doing to get there. Here's where I see myself 20 years from now 10 years from now five years from now next year Here's the roadmap that I need to put in place to get me there if Poor and middle class people are going to prosper. They're going to need to develop vision. Got to start seeing the future more than you see your past. One of the reasons that poor people take so long to make decisions is because they live in the past. They see their past failures and because of that, they're bringing that into this present day decision. And because they're bringing past failures into this decision, they are reluctant to make the decision. Therefore, they're not creating the future that they want tomorrow. Last but not least, this is the most important, man. Uh, and this is where I get on my uh, pitch machine. This is where I get on my soapbox. Because we're talking about prospering, uh, those other things that you get over, they will help you prosper in your relationships. They will help you prosper in your family. They can even help you prosper in your career. But if you want to prosper financially, the one thing that poor and middle class people will need to learn more than anything else, and again, social engineering, hey, IT, social engineering has really done its work on us. But the one thing poor and middle class, if the name of the game is for you to prosper financially, the one thing poor and middle class people absolutely have to learn above all else is how to operate as a business versus an individual. Poor and middle class people absolutely have to learn how to operate as a business versus an individual. This is where the greatest social engineering is taking place and keeping us in poverty uh, generation after generation after generation. I want you guys to, to think, back, think about something. And you probably can't even see how this would even work because of where you're, you've been conditioned mentally. A hundred years ago, 95% of Americans were business owners. Only 5% worked for somebody else. Most people are, you're going to instantly go to, wait a minute, if everybody owned a business, who did the work? Because you don't know how capitalism works. A hundred years ago, 95% of the people 
in this country were business owners, 5% were employees. What that means is, you're saying Cortez, somebody had to work at the factory. Somebody had to work uh, um, in this, uh, uh, this field and that field, right? That is true, but the way that all happened is everybody worked as a 1099. So if I owned a store and I needed to hire some help at the store, then I would contract with someone who is an independent business owner farming out their labor under contract and a 1099 situation and I would pay that person all their money, they would be responsible for paying their taxes. Nowadays, everybody wants to be a W-2 because we've been socially engineered to be that way. But if you understand the system that you live in, which is a capitalistic democracy, you understand the, the two best positions to be in are 1099 and investor class. That's the two best positions to be in in a capitalistic democracy. You've got the labor force, you've got the business owner, and you've got the investor. The two best positions to be in is the business owner and the investor. The labor force brings nothing to the table. Therefore, they pay the most amount of taxes of everybody in the whole system. Cortez, the labor force brings labor to the table. Yeah, but if the business owner didn't create the job for you to bring that labor to the table, you wouldn't be bringing nothing to the table. So why business owners get all the tax breaks? The investors provide the capital for the business owner to expand inventory and infrastructure. Therefore, investors pay least taxes of them all. Poor and middle class people will absolutely have to learn how this whole system works if they're going to prosper financially. Now, everybody ain't here to prosper financially. I get it. Some of you guys are comfortable and content with where you are and that's perfectly all right. You guys know that on Talking Money in the Morning Live, this is a zero judgment zone. I don't judge. If you are content with trying to make a job work for you, cool. If, on the other hand, you're trying to build generational wealth, it's going to be extremely difficult for you to do that without a business. Start operating as a business. I want you to think about something. What are the two main entities that finance our school system? The government and corporations. I learned about 15 years ago, if you want to understand something, all you have to do is follow the money. So you follow the money. How do government get its money? It gets its money by taxing employees. So it makes sense that they create a school system that trains, educates, and produces employees. In order for corporations to expand and grow, what do they need? They also need employees. So as they're funding the school system, they're funding the system with a bit on that system producing for them quality yet obedient employees. So when you follow the money, you say, hey, the people who finance the school are getting from the school system exactly what they want. They want employees. The government want employees to tax. Corporations want employees to work. That's why we're socially engineered to think employee first versus business owner entrepreneurship. When you learn uh, to operate as a business, then you also learn to stop overpaying taxes. Taxes is your number one expense. Working people don't understand how taxes work. 
They don't understand how the system works. They pay taxes and they and 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 they just try to their best to live off what's left. Here's what you're saying when you go to your job every day. You say, "I'm going to work first. I'm going to pay taxes second. Then I'm going to try to live off what's left." This is what you're saying. You don't realize you're saying it. You're saying, "I'm going to go to work first. I'm going to pay taxes second." Then I'm going to try to spend and live off what's left. And then on top of that, everything that, I'm, that I spend is taxed again. I don't think y'all hear this and, and, and really get what's happening to you. This is what's happening to you. You go to work. Before you bring your paycheck home, you are taxed. Once you get your paycheck and you try to spend and carve out a life for yourself, everything that you spend on is taxed again. Then if you're in a state like Missouri, you pay taxes on everything that you own. There's, it's called a personal property tax. I got taxed when I earned the money. I paid a sales tax when I bought the thing and now I pay a personal property tax every year for owning the thing. You guys don't realize it, but you're taxed about 50% of your income. When you add all the taxes up that you pay, about 30% of income tax is gone from your check before you get it. Then you add your real estate tax, your personal property tax, uh, your state tax, your city and local tax. Then you add in um, your sales tax. About 50% of your income is gone to taxes. And you wonder why when you look at your gross income and you add up all your bills, you're saying to your spouse, babe, we should, we should be making it. We, we should be making it. We should be all right. We make enough money. We shouldn't be struggling like, like we're struggling. Because nobody factors in the taxes that they pay. You're trying to live a gross lifestyle on a net income, and that math just doesn't work. Yeah, we don't own any land. Yeah, the, the tax code is set up to benefit business owners, landowners, and investors. So, since you don't own any land, you might want to consider owning a business. Make that business produce, minimize your taxes, and then take your tax savings and go buy you some land. And pay even less in taxes, right? There's a couple things that you learn when you understand how the system is work. You learn to stop overpaying your taxes. You learn to stop taking vacations. I haven't taken a vacation in about five or six years. Why? Because vacations aren't tax deductible. If I'm going to operate as a business, then I understand instead of taking vacations, I take business trips and I can write the business trips off and that's going to save me a ton of money. See, this is why you have to operate as a business. Business owners get certain perks that employees do not get. Landowners get certain perks that employees do not get. Investors get certain perks that uh, 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 employees do not get. So I operate my life as a business. So when I travel, everywhere I go, there's always a business meeting on the agenda. There's always a workshop, a training, or something so that I can write off the trip. Operate as a business. Working class people have to understand that. We're talking about twelve to $15,000 per year on average is what people save when they understand this concept alone. Twelve to fifteen thousand dollars per year, and, and I want you to think about something. So, if you're saving twelve to fifteen thousand dollars per year, the average person 
is paying about twelve to fifteen thousand dollars per year in interest payments on debt. The average person pays twelve to fifteen thousand dollars per year in interest payments on their debt. So just think about it. Operating as a business allows me to save that same twelve to fifteen thousand dollars. So what can I do with it? Get yourself out of debt. Now you got the money you need to start investing. Now you need the money, you got the money you need to start investing, right? When you learn to operate as a business, as a working person, I got a regular job. I just go and 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 work my regular job. But in addition to that regular job, I have a business that I run myself. Jay-Z said it's best. I'm not a businessman. I am a business man. You're, you're looking at the embodiment of a business. Everything that I do. Now, for some of you, it's going to take a, 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 a one day, 180 degree turn in your mental capacity and your mindset to grasp this. But it's worth making that 180 degree turn. And everything that I am, every fiber of my being is a business. Right? And when you learn how this works, then you can save yourself a ton of money from a tax standpoint. You take those tax savings and use it to double and triple down on your debts. Get your car notes paid. Get your mortgage paid off. Get your furniture uh, loans paid off. Get your student loans paid off. Get your credit cards paid down. This is how you, you, you prosper financially in America. This is, this is how all wealth has been created from scratch. Through entrepreneurship. You learn to stop driving your personal vehicle when you understand this concept. I don't have a personal vehicle. I have a company vehicle that I use sometimes to take to run personal errands. Why? Because 54 and a half cent per mile I drive for business is worth me tracking my miles. Worth me separating the, the trips that I go on personally versus the trips that I go on for business. 54 and a half cent per mile. You've got to understand how this whole system works. We live in a capitalistic democracy. Learn capitalism and how it works. Capitalism is a political and economic system. Learn the politics of capitalism and then learn the economics of capitalism. We're talking about the economics of capitalism right now. Operate as a business so that you can get tax write-offs. Take your tax savings. Get yourself out of debt. It's time for us to come up with a new American dream because the one that we've been fed was fed to us by the banks. The, the American dream that we were fed was fed to us by the banks. That's why we're all in debt. Go to school. Got to get in debt to do that. 80, 75% of people who go to college end up with college loans and college debt. Get you a good job so you can buy that house with a white picket fence. Who taught us that? The people who give you the loans to get the house with a white picket fence was behind that campaign to make everybody homeowners. You got the house with the white picket fence, you got to have the car. Who taught us that? The people who financed the car. Every home, in order for it to be a thrive at home, must have two incomes, so now the wife has to work. Who taught us that? The people who wanted to finance the second car for your wife. You Got to rethink this American dream thing. I want you to know something, man. If, if we really start rethinking this thing, we start operating as a business. That means we're going to train our children to operate as a business when they're young. 
they're going to operate as a business and by the time they graduate from college which they don't need any loans for because you understand how to operate as a business and how to get that done and get it paid for because your tax savings you don't have any debt if they decide to go to college at all they might just go straight into entrepreneurship there are kids with multi-million dollar lemonade businesses I mentor a kid who is a best-selling author right now and owns four to six vending machines right we teach them how to operate as a business it's a big difference we're talking about prospering financially we teach that generation how to operate as a business and chances are they could be multi-millionaires by the time they're 25 but let me give you a a, 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 sim, a, a smaller scale scenario Take my son who's 19. Now, he wanted to move out and do his own thing. But if he wanted to stay home, I could have easily helped him save $20,000, $30,000 in the next two or three years. He takes that $20,000, that $30,000, and when he's ready to move out, instead of taking that money and getting financing to buy a single family home, he takes that $20,000 and he uses it as a down payment on a four family flat, an eight unit apartment building, maybe a fixer upper, maybe only two units in operation. But he takes it, he gets to live in one unit, he gets to rent out one unit, and he can slowly fix up the other units. This is how we have to start thinking as a business. Now because he owns property, now he gets to manage how much taxes from his income he pays. What if someone had taught you that when you were 18 years old, 19 years old, 20 years old? And by the time you're 25, you own a four unit apartment complex, an eight unit apartment complex where you're making passive income. It's time for us to start understanding how to operate as a business. Who's knocking on my door at 8 o'clock this morning? Interrupting my show. Uh, all right. Hold on, hold on, hold on. All right. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Just one minute. Excuse me. Did I see a car there? It is, but it doesn't work. You can't get the thing without. I'm not sure. I don't want to take a chance of getting close to it. I don't even think we can put it in. Nope. No we steering wheel on it. We had to take off the steering wheel. Pardon? We had to take off the steering wheel problem, so we can't even turn it over to put it in the middle right. to even push it. Oh, so neighbors across the street got something going on. And they want us to move a car that we can't move. All right. So last but not least, you learn to stop paying your kids an allowance and you start paying them a salary. Right? My bad, child. Nobody ever knocks on my door at 8 o'clock in the morning. You learn to stop paying your kids an allowance and you start learning how to pay them a salary. Right? Because your children's lifestyle then becomes a tax write-off. Right? To listen to you today appears to have been divinely guided. Uh, I appreciate that, Ken. Glad. Thank you for tuning in. Don't forget to subscribe to the YouTube channel uh, and like and rate the show. I appreciate that, that comment, though. So, here's another thing that poor and middle class people don't understand about entrepreneurship. And why it's worth even just having a business to try to learn and implement these strategies. If you got kids, chances are you're spending a couple hundred dollars per month on those kids. You're spending a couple hundred dollars per month on those kids. Well, you're going to spend that money whether you have a business or not. If you have a business, now you can give those kids a salary for working in your business and now you, in essence, created a tax-deductible lifestyle for your children. Right? So, for instance, the standard deduction went from $6,350 to $12,000.
And again, you have to study the system that you live in. That means I can pay my child $12,000 this year for working in my business and that's a write-off for me. So if I make uh, $50,000 in my business, I pay one of my sons $12,000 for the year for doing, uh, 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 helping me market my business, uh, helping me with equipment and all that kind of stuff, end up paying them $12,000, then I don't pay taxes on $50,000. I pay taxes on $38,000. Then I look at the miles that I drove for business. If I drove 10,000 miles for business, then 54 cent a mile, that's $5,400 uh, $5, in um, a tax write-off. So that comes off the 38,000, right? So now I'm down to what, 33,6? Then I look at uh, my travel expenses, right? I've already done two travel trips this year. I've probably got eight to 10 more to do before the year is out. That might bring another $5,000 off my income. So now I'm down to about 28,000, 27,000, right? Then I look at uh, uh, my advertising costs and my communication and all of those fees that I have to take off. That's another 5,000. Now I'm down to 20,000, right? So now I pay taxes on 20,000 versus 50,000 because I have some expenses to take care of. You guys understand why you need to operate as a business? And what does it require for you to operate as a business? It doesn't require a whole lot. Simply start a business. Usually I, I encourage people, when I coach people, people come to me for business coaching, what kind of business should I start? Think about your passions. You should be doing something that you're passionate about. Something that you're doing right now for free could be turned into a business and now you get all of these benefits. Something you're doing right now, every day, every week, every month, you could be doing that as a business, but right now you're doing it for free. Something you just love to do, you're helping out with the kids, you, you, you sew on the side, you, you uh, 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 make t-shirts, you make jewelry, whatever. You're doing some of this stuff for free, turn it into a business. Go to your Secretary of State, register your fictitious name and your DBA. Go get your tax ID number if you want to. Uh, uh, register an uh, LLC if you want to. But start a business. You got to work your business regularly. You got to work your business in an attempt to make a profit and you got to keep good records. And now all of these tax deductions are at your fingertips and at your disposal so that you can build wealth, so that you can prosper financially. Because here's the thing, whether you make money in business or not, you just have to attempt to make a profit and everything that you spent to make a profit, if you end up with a loss, say for instance, you spent $20,000 trying to get your business off the ground, but you didn't make any money. The IRS says you can subtract that business loss from the money you made on your job. So if you made $50,000 on your job and you attempted to Work, uh, run a business and you spent $50,000 to make uh, $20,000 to make that happen, even though you didn't make any money, you get to take that $20,000, subtract it from the $50,000, now you pay taxes on 30. You can levy at, or, or, or reduce uh, any income, you can take business loss against any income. So I can take this $20,000 that I lost in business because I tried, I advertised, I marketed, I had some startup costs, I, had some, I bought some equipment. I can take that whole loss and subtract it from the income that I made on my job and I'll pay less taxes on that. Operating as a business can change your life. But it's going to take you to learn the strategy. So that's it for today, man. We're a little bit over. We started a little bit late. I appreciate you guys for tuning in. Uh, again, today's show is brought to you by the Black Wealth Movement. We teach this as, as a, our core curriculum in the Black Wealth Movement. This is what we teach. 
So you gotta got an insight on how we help people win financially in the Black Wealth Movement. It'd be seventy dollars to start, fifty dollars per month to maintain your membership, uh, and you get a business so that you can run this strategy. Right. Today's show is also brought to you by uh, the Black Billionaires Club. Uh, they're doing their uh, Generational Wealth Building Conference April 6th through the 8th in Atlanta, Georgia. You can grab your tickets at wealth.joincortezenow.com. Uh, wealth.joincortezenow.com. I know what I said to some of you guys were very foreign. Do your research, though. Don't just blow it off. If you want to build generational wealth, do your research. If you want to partner with us, and let us hold your hand through this process so you can learn to implement these strategies, then all you got to do is shoot me an inbox and I'll get you some more information. So you guys know tomorrow is uh, Free Business Coaching Fridays um, where we, we help you with your business and your brand and all that stuff. Oh, I forgot to make my announcement. If you're in the Kansas City area, uh, Saturday, um, March 24th, I will be in town with a wealth workshop from uh, 8.30 to 1.30. Uh, 3210 Michigan Avenue, Kansas City, Missouri. All you got to do is inbox me. I'll get you all those details. Uh, uh, yes, if you want the uh, to learn about the uh, Generational Wealth Building Conference in Atlanta, Georgia, go to wealth.joincortezenow.com. Wealth.joincortezenow.com. That's the Generational Wealth Conference. Uh, what do you think about the Acoin app? Uh, if it's going to encourage our people to uh, save and uh, invest and grow wealth, I'm all for anything that's going to help our people get in uh, the space where they're learning how to invest, save money, grow, and build wealth. However, I don't think that is that's a good start. But running this strategy, investing in a business to grow a business, the biggest investments ever made are always in private equity businesses. You think about what Nas did with a few hundred thousand dollars invested in uh, that startup. And when a company was bought by Amazon, he made 40 million bucks. So understanding how to invest in, in private business Take advantage of capitalism in that way is a whole different deal. Should I invest my money into a business or into a real property first? Uh, good question. Uh, we'd have to talk a little bit offline based on your financial goals. What is your goal? Is your goal cash flow or is your uh, goal long-term equity? Um, that, that would be the goal. Real estate is not going to get you the cash flow. Uh, as quickly as as some uh, as investing in some businesses that can create monthly cash flow for you out of the gate. So based, it's based on your long term goal. It's not necessarily based on which one is better. Which one is better for you in attaining the goal that you want to have? Some people got cash flow and they're trying to take the cash flow and create equity. Some people have no uh, cash flow, so they need to build a cash flow stream. So it just kind of depends on what your financial goals are. So come back tomorrow. We answer those kinds of questions when we talk our uh, free business coaching Friday. I'm your boy H. Cortez, the one and only financial health mentor to the black community. Everybody's favorite fatherpreneur. Until I talk to you next time, I want you to get your money up because you absolutely can do it. But more importantly, you deserve to do it each and every one of you. Peace out, y'all.